Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As we never get tired of repeating, this show is about holding police accountable. To do so, we go beyond the examples of misconduct and delve deeper into the political economy that sustains a system that is often unjust and unchecked. But before I go any further, I want to remind you that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out. You can email us tips privately at parattherealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. You know I read your comments and I appreciate them. Now, as you may have seen on our last show, we spoke with a freedom activist called Blind Justice. He was inspecting public buildings in Guilford, North Carolina for compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, but his presence was met with violence. That's because before he could finish his work, a private security guard executed an arrest. Let's watch. Who are you? I don't know who you are. Stop. This is assault and battery. Stop. Yes, help. Help. Assault. Help. Assault. Help. 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 Somebody help me. Stop. 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 Ow. Ow. You're hurting me. What are you doing? But this troubling encounter brings up an interesting point. Why would the presence of a blind veteran wielding a camera elicit such a violent response? Why does the current surveillance state, which we inhabit, operate as a one-way street where the government watches us, but we can't watch them? And what does it say about the state of American law enforcement that the presence of a camera must be extinguished by the taking of freedom? Consider this, two weeks ago, we reported on the indictment of a Prince George's Maryland officer named Michael Owen. Owen was charged with second degree murder nearly 24 hours after he shot a handcuffed man who was sitting in the front of his patrol car seven times. The charges were announced after Prince George's County Police Chief said he had no explanation for the shooting. But recently, Officer Owen appeared in court for a bail hearing, and it's what happened then that speaks to the theme of our show today. So, Stephen, you've been covering this. Yeah. What happened? Well, Officer Owen's lawyers made the uh, argument that it was a rush to judgment to charge him for second-degree murder because he shot a man seven times. They said that they were throwing police officers under the bus and not giving him fair process, wow. and that they shouldn't be bringing these charges so quickly because they need a length the investigation, which has always been the police sort of mantra going in these type of killings to say, we need to take time. But of course, the police chief has already said he can't explain it. And there was no evidence, any evidence of any sort of struggle or any of the things that they had said initially to justify the shooting. And there's the point. His lawyer offered no explanation as to why his client shot a man in handcuffs seven times at point blank range. He didn't even give a hint of what evidence he would present to explain why his client shot a man who couldn't fight back. No, instead he evokes the ethos that pervades law enforcement, if we did it, it can't be wrong. Meaning, American police have no problem slapping handcuffs on people for reasons that seem inexplicable, and they have no problem executing unjust laws like drug possession with impunity. The point is that the act itself is not the problem, the power is the point. We have it, you don't. That's enough to explain almost anything we do, and that's the point Officer Owen's lawyer is trying to make. But some people don't agree, and they are willing to fight peacefully to make that point. And today we have just such an example of how police behave when they confront dissent. I'm talking about the arrest of an auditor called Otto the Watchdog. Now, just a note before I delve deeper into this story, auditors are a growing group of dedicated activists who use video to hold government institutions like policing accountable. It's a process we've covered in depth before, including the aforementioned story of blind justice and recently the arrest of Kenneth Dunham, who was hauled off to jail in Oregon for trying to shoot video of parked police cars. And to date, we have another troubling story about an auditor under attack. He is known on YouTube as Otto the Watchdog. Otto was standing on public property engaging in one of the most fundamental of American rights, freedom of speech. Otto was holding signs expressing his displeasure with the current state of affairs, but police in Royce, Texas took issue with Otto's First Amendment field display. That's because one of his signs included an expletive, um, essentially that the system won't unfuck itself. His choice of words prompted complaints, which means, of course, that police showed up because what else do they have to do but harass a man holding a sign? Let's watch. Back. 
but to get a better sense of what happened and why, we are joined by the man himself, Otto the Watchdog, because this story does not end with his arrest. Otto, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So my first question is, what prompts you to stand on public property and hold these signs? What issues are you trying to address? Well, my my issues are are, uh, are my own, and of course, everybody has their own issues. Uh, my goal is specifically to, uh, to to bring to light whatever your problem is. Uh, that's why my signs don't say anything specific. Um, mm-hmm. They just uh, conjure images of whatever your problem is. Uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the, the system isn't going to unfuck itself. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I like to hold signs that uh, that can be interpreted. Uh, by different people in different ways. Whatever your problem is, that's my problem as well. So tell me, what reason did the police give you for your arrest, and what did they charge you with? Uh, Well, originally they charged me with uh, disorderly conduct, offensive language, um, resisting arrest, and uh, failure to identify. Um, Of course, I talked to them out of the the failure to identify in Texas. It's 3802. And... um, the resisting arrest was changed to uh, interference with public duties. Otto, one thing that struck me as interesting, coming from Baltimore, where we have a ton of crime, wh- why did police take the time right. to harass you or to arrest you just over a sign? It seems to me to be something that wouldn't even be worth the time of police. Why were police so interested in, in you know, coming after you in that way? There's not a lot of crimes with victims here. Uh, it's mostly traffic violations, um, maybe drug possession, uh, things of that sort. They really don't have a lot else to do. So um, when when there's a guy holding a sign, I guess that was the highest priority that they had at the time. Um, you said something really fascinating. You said the sign is meant to elicit your problem, not your own. And that's very interesting. Can you delve deeper a little bit into that? Are you, are you trying to sort of reflect back on people, their own prejudice or own? What, what is it exactly you're aiming for? Because that's a very interesting statement. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I don't. I have absolutely no interest in advocating for my problems. My problems are my problems, right? Um, what, what I want to do is get people engaged uh, to do something themselves. Whatever you have an issue with, that's what my problem is. Right? If your problem is uh, is uh, taxation, then my problem is taxation. If, uh, my signs are, are, are uh, meant to uh, make you feel something and then come to me with it. And then we have that discussion. Um a good de- a, a, in debate, you never you never know what side you're going to be on, uh, and the, the conversation is is the most important thing, and that's what my signs are designed to do. Now, I just I just have to ask you: in that video, we see you passively dropping, which is you know a classic technique of anyone who has done any peaceful protesting. How on earth did they turn that into resisting arrest? I don't know. Uh, as a matter of fact, that happened uh, over a year about a year and a half ago now, I still haven't been to trial on it. I've been fighting that case, a class C misdemeanor for over a year and a half. And I haven't gone to trial for that yet. And the prosecutors are still pursuing this case a year and a half later over a class C misdemeanor. They're still, they still won't drop it. No, they won't drop it. Uh, well, they haven't yet. Um, of course, uh, uh, I've written several motions to dismiss, uh, based on the first amendment, uh, including case laws. Um, we even had a, uh, a reenactment, uh, reenactment of the uh, of that event, with uh, close to twenty, maybe thirty people, holding way more offensive signs, and uh, no one was arrested that day. Wow! So, I don't know why they haven't dropped it. Uh, I think, I think it. I mean, there must be a reason. I just don't know why. Now, Otto, your story doesn't just end there. Can you tell us what happened since this occurred? Because I think I may have seen instances of retaliation against you by the police. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it, my, story, my story doesn't begin there, and it, it also doesn't end there. Um, I was coming to court um, in August of uh, 2019 um, on that Class C misdemeanor. In preparation the night before, before my, this was supposed to be a trial, I was camping with my kids on a, on a farm road, you know, they, uh, the, the police showed up and I wasn't even sure that they were police at the time, but they, they arrested me and charged me with child endangerment. I'm not even sure how much I, I can get into on that. 
You know, um, just so you know, Otto, I <coughs> saw the, the video of that, and it looks as if you see lights come up to your, your car or camper, and you get out to see who's approaching. And then that's right. when they charge with child endangerment, because you, you get out of your car to see who's approaching your car. Is, and your children seem just so frightened during that video. It was just terrible to watch. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm at the end of a dirt road, and uh, I see lights approaching. Um, I saw them in the distance, and I was kind of making like a. Um, I was, it was supposed to be funny, you know, talking to the camera. But when they when they got closer, uh, and I realized that they were coming at me, uh, I was I, I wasn't actually sure what they were, and um, I stepped out of the car because uh, I was inside my truck, just like I am right now. Uh, talking to a camera, you know, mm -hmm. I do this a lot. Um, and they, they were approaching and I, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have any lights on any red and blues or nothing. So I stepped out and asked what, who they were. Uh, I think I said, what are you or something mm -hmm. of that sort, you know, middle of the night, just drove all day, you know, and then, uh, to have vehicles approach you in the dark. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure why, why they said child endangerment. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I did that was criminal. Right. Uh, I don't. I don't think there was anything criminal with that. And obviously, you know, nobody else sees what they're talking about either. Now, we've seen a lot more auditors popping up across the country. Why do you think people are picking up cameras and holding our government accountable in this specific way? I, I think that the camera is uh, it holds both both sides accountable, right? So the, the police have body cams. They have dash cams. They have microphones. Right. They have drones, you know, they have all this stuff. They have street cameras and all that. Uh, so I think that the camera uh, just points, uh, just reflects back on them. It shows it shows the other side because you, when you're watching a body cam, you only get to see what, what the officer sees. You don't get to see what we see. Otto, that's a really profound statement because you're basically saying that, you know, there's only one perspective in the perspective of governance. And then you are saying that by take, picking up the cameras, we're adding a different perspective because perspective is everything when it comes to media or any of this stuff. So you're basically saying that the people are basically taking back the narrative through these kind of, you know, using cameras um, on their own without sort of in sort of situations where power is, there is an imbalance of power. Is that what you're saying, basically? Oh yeah, there's definitely an imbalance of power. I mean, they have unlimited funding to take your rights away, and we are working on little or sometimes no money uh, mm. to, to fight back against that. So, uh, having a, just just having a cell phone, just having a little a phone like this, you know, this is a free phone that I got when I uh, when I signed up for my phone plan. Uh, it, it can it can completely change everything, just so that you have a, a document a recording of, of an event right now is huge. Um, uh, of course, this story wouldn't have, have been got, gotten anywhere if I hadn't been recording at the time. Right. I, uh, we, uh, we still haven't fully gotten discovery on that case. So even uh, six months later, I still wouldn't have any idea what, what had happened that night because, yeah. of course, I was taken away immediately. You know, Otto, I think you made a really interesting point that having these phones, these cameras ourselves, changes the perspective of the narrative. Can Absolutely. I just add one thing to you? And this is kind of interesting because when we cover policing as um, mainstream media, Otto makes a good point. Uh, the mainstream media would cover Otto's arrest, say, you know, a man was holding a sign and caused problems with police. And the whole story would get out from the police perspective because they write the charging documents. But when Otto has a camera and then can post what happened to him, yes. suddenly it's a completely different multidimensional perspective Absolutely. on criminality, which we all know that, you know, criminology is narratology. It gives you a narrative of someone's life, but Otto can say, you know what, there's another perspective that you're not seeing. Yes. And I think it's kind of fascinating when you think about it um, because it kind of takes away the power of policing to create this narrative about us because people are innocent until proven guilty, but usually the media just reports what police say about people. Yes. But or mugshots up there and says they're criminals. I think this is a really important way that people can disrupt the narrative that law right. enforcement has used against the public for yeah. decades. Yeah. Well, if I was to read the, the police reports on these two events, I would convict myself. <laughs> uh, right. Without seeing the videos, of course. Um, uh, and I, as, a, as an activist, I've read hundreds of police reports. And some of these are, you know, dozen pages long or, long, or more, you know. Uh, and then uh, when you read the report and then you get to watch the video, right. they don't add up. Almost 
I don't, I can't think of, of one instance. Well, of course, I only get the, the worst of the worst as you do as well. Um, but I can't think of one instance where I read the report and watched the video and was like, oh, this, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, mm. this is exactly accurate. It's yeah. always one sided. Well, so we've definitely the had the same experience. Fight back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The only way to fight back is, is to equal the playing field with the same tools. And unfortunately, they have unlimited funding. Right. And uh, we're working off of little or no budget. Very true. Well, it's clear watching Otto's video and others that have appeared on the show that there is a movement afoot that the mainstream media is ignoring, a collective activism that has less to do with politics than the basic tenets of freedom, an idea essential to the health of our democracy, that the ability of an individual to petition the government cannot be ignored or otherwise diminished. Think about it. There are countless people armed with cell phone cameras, putting themselves at risk of arrest, activists armed with just cell phones, taking powerful government institutions flush with cash and influence on. And meanwhile, the mainstream media and high paid pundits ignore them. Not just what they're doing, but the deeper sense of unease their work evinces that somehow the delicate balance between the rights of the people and the overwhelming power of the government has become misaligned. And that this imbalance more than anything has set the stage for other unexplainable inequities. That the power that wealth affords governments has as much to do with the economic disparities and social ills inflicted upon the people than any other policy. When you really think about it, why would the police arrest a man for holding a sign or for taking a picture of a police car? Why would a blind veteran checking on accommodations for the disabled be subject to a brutal arrest? Perhaps it's because auditors represent something that government officials don't want to acknowledge, that they have forgotten their true purpose serving the people. Perhaps that's why when the cameras are turned on them, it causes them so much discomfort. Why dedicated activists showing up on people's property prompts violent arrests. Maybe the camera makes them uncomfortable because it's a reminder of a concept they have long forgotten, a symbol of the people who they prefer to ignore but cannot when they're confronted. It's through the lens of an auditor we see clearly the injustice that would otherwise be obscured. Through the cameras of the people is where the true imperative of power is exposed. I want to thank our guest, Otto the Watchdog, for joining us today. Thank you so much for being here, Otto. No, thank you for, for being there and doing what you do. And I want to thank my colleague, Stephen Janis, for his invaluable reporting and writing. And of course, I have to say thank you to Noli D, who once again helped make this episode possible. Mm -hmm. Hi, Noli. And I want you, that's right. And I want you to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct, please send it to us and we might be able to investigate. Please email us privately at parattherealnews.com. And of course, you can follow or message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Facebook or Twitter. And please like and share our videos to help us get the word out to help activists like Otto and Blind Justice. My name is Taya Graham, and I want to thank you for joining me for this police accountability report. Please be safe out there. <laughs>